Thanks for listening to this Word in Your Ear podcast. If you'd like to get early access to all our productions ad-free, priority booking for our live events, and to take part in our weekly quiz, go to patreon.com slash wordinyourear for more details. Word down your way. Testing. Two, two. Welcome to another edition of Word Down Your Way. I can still remember the excitement of these early Buzzcock singles arriving in the NME offices where I was working at the time. And I just had a rootle round in the attic and found my clear vinyl uh, Razor Cuts bootleg from 1979. And you feel that all is well when you know mm. that uh, the group are still touring. They're currently in the middle of a world tour uh, almost 50 years later and now led by Steve Diggle. Steve, it's lovely to see you. How are you doing? Lovely, lovely to be here, yes. Like and you're said, back home, in... aren't you, I think? Yes, but we're on this uh, never-ending tour, really. Um, so I'm back home now, but uh, the end of the week, um, uh, we're playing press, and then we go back to America and all this sort of thing, and Australia. In Australia so, and New Zealand? Yeah. I'm, and I think that's the schedule the for the club, yeah. And the 100 club, yeah. And how's it going? Are, are, there, are there places where you get a particularly warm reception? Yeah, absolutely, you know. I mean, it's a testament to the songs that we wrote years ago. You know, they still serve the, serve the uh, sort of test of time. And um, and also, I did a new album last year, and people loved that as well. You know, the key words to keep it relevant. And they love the new album, when that fits in with the old stuff. And so, you know, it's still very much alive, you know. And, um, and at the shows, uh, there's a lot of younger people coming as well as people our age in the 50s and 60s. You know, it's spanning uh, about three generations now. And uh, it's amazing to see young kids. I used to be the same as same age as those in the audience at the front. Then I was old enough to be their fathers, and I'm sure I'm old enough to be some of their grandfathers. But, uh, you know, um, they still keep coming and they love it. You know, we had oh, a... That must be fa- so satisfying. Fa- mm. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, look, we were going to just ask you about kind of uh, early memories, really, of, of the whole idea of live performance. Can you remember the first groups you ever saw? Yeah. Um, actually, one of them, the first... Uh, I saw a group called Silverhead. Oh, oh right. God, Silverhead. Yeah, Michael yeah, Desbars. Michael Desbars. Yeah. Nigel Harrison of Blondie on bass. That's Is that right. right. <laughs> yes. I saw them at a place called the Stone Ground in Manchester, which was sort of... Um, Oh, right. uh, around the Gorton area. Oh, yeah. It was a little run-down place. And the, I think the week after, they had uh, Leo Serum when he was dressed as a clown, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> Did you see him? Um, yeah, because I think that was booked before he had the, you know, got a bit of fame on yeah, Top yeah. of the Pops. That's so right. He pro- he that was his act, to, wasn't it? Yes, he, he probably had to fill the contracts, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> and... Even though I'd been on top of the box, he had to turn up with this really run-down nightclub with the sticky carpets and all that, you know. But I think um, years ago, so was Michael Desbars there in all his glam rock finery? In, in yes, it was like there was like a cross between the Stones and the New York Dolls in a sense, yeah. wasn't it? You know, yeah. but and, that um, was 1972, <laughs> wasn't it? I think they had the album Sixteen and Savage. And, yeah. And, yeah, well, that's what I liked, and. Uh, <clears throat> He had songs like More Than Your Mouth Can Hold, though, and so it was odd titles. <laughs> yes, Christ. <laughs> Hello, New York is another one. But yeah. um, they, they seemed quite a, kind of quite good, that. You know, they had uh, Robbie, somebody on guitar, slide guitar, and Michael Desbar's out like, across between Mick Jagger and you know, that kind of thing. Uh, it was just exciting seeing that live, you know. Another group I saw live early on was Status Quo. <laughs> oh, really? Everybody. Yeah. Do, you like, do you like Status Quo? Yeah, yeah. My brother had a tape from college years ago, and it had all the early stuff on, you know, Mark Kelly's Greasy Spoon and Pizza and Maxi Men. And um, I think they just brought Paper Plane out, and that's somehow I got a ticket, you know. Um, right. And... Um, because I didn't know officially how to buy tickets, really. You know, we used to just kind of turn up. Yeah. The, door, the yeah. doorman used to be like Potter, you know. So somebody would go in, bring six tickets out, and then you'd go in and then hand them to somebody else, you know. <laughs> and the door, doorman in those days was kind of like, you know, with the peak cap, where are you going? You know, and we'd 
we'd get and see many things like that uh, for free. You know? But I saw Bowie as well on the Ziggy Stardust tour as well. Oh, right. Um, what, did you look, what did you look like at the time? Did you have long hair or what? I had long hair, yeah. Because, um, I mean, I, I was a child of the uh, the 60s, you know. I think when I, my cousin had a uh, little Richard and um, and um, uh, took Berry and stuff, which I loved. But then the Beatles came along in 62. And um, so I'd be seven years old and I was primed to be... So the Beatles came out. I remember hearing Jimmy Hanley's radio show and um, he used to play children's favourites. You know, right. you yeah, can't yeah. say Charlie Drake and Rolf Harris and people yeah. like that, uh, Bernard Cribbins. And then one day this song Love Me Do came on and it really stuck out, you know. And um, so I got into that. And also George Best in 1963, I think when the first, first Beatles album came out, he just joined Manchester United as a 17-year-old. So that crystallised my youth, really. It was like, then, you know, it was the Kinks and the Stones and all, all, all those 60s group. And Manchester United at the same time, you know. So right. um, George they, Best they felt like a pop star, didn't he? Don't you think? He was. He was always yeah. the fifth, fifth Beatle. There's been many claiming that one, but he, he kind of was, you know. He was. And, um, and it was glamorous because when he didn't go up for, turn up for training, you know, that seemed really exciting, you know. Mike yeah. Busby on, on the television going, I don't know where the lad is. And then he'd probably turn up after a three-day binge somewhere. He'd get on the pitch and score, you know. So he seemed very glamorous and uh, <laughs> he, he's very stylish and exciting because all the other footballers at the time seemed really old, you know. Even when they were 20, yeah. they, they looked so about 35 with they short back and They looked 30 years old and they actually were. Yeah, and they had broken hair and short back and sides. Like, yeah, yeah. you know, it looked as if they'd gone through national service. That yes. was the that's right. Whereas George was, Best, like oh, the Beatles, it's the same thing with the Beatles. They hadn't mm. got national service. Consequently, they'd grown their hair a bit. Yes, maybe it was the national service kind of mentality that yeah, they, they were the escaped from. Not to have to do it. That's right. So yeah, they were yeah. different. You know, yeah. So, what about yeah. the level of punk in your life? Um. So. Then you sort of grow up, you know, it was the hippie days, the heavy metal days, you know, the Beatles split up, suddenly you had to get this used to this high uh, Janis Joplin voice called Robert Plant, you know. So I got into that and the Groundhogs and people like that. A guy used to say at school, um, uh, the Comprehensive School boys had the Led Zeppelin albums and the Grammar School boys had the Deep Purple ones. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I was That's good. Up, but, yeah, and maybe that was true, you know, but... Uh, did you like Deep Purple? Uh, yeah, you know I like Led Zeppelin more because it's come from the blues. But I did like it, you know, uh, you know Highway Star and all that's great. It was all good stuff, you know. Um, and it was sort of relatively new then before it got a bit heavy metal started to get a bit weird in the eighties, you know. <laughs> right, right. As Robert Plant said, we we might be responsible for starting heavy metal, but we're not responsible for what it became, you know. <laughs> um, so. You know, there's that. So there was all that. Then the yeah, there was a time when every guitarist either wanted to be Richie Blackmore or Jimmy Page. That's right. You looked at the ads, they were all looking for bass players and drummers, and uh, they, they, they were, you know, they were Richie Blackmore, Jimmy Page. Um, but then, the, you know, along came Yes and people like that. And um, that was all right for a moment, you know, taking a mushroom and listening to half hour about them singing mushrooms in the sky. But suddenly, <laughs> the, you know, but when, when you're coming up, you know, to a, a, a million on the dole in the early 70s and things like that, and, um, you know, the songs were all getting too long at that time, you know, and all this and concept things on eyes. And it's like, hold on, we, we need something live and exciting. Now I'm coming up to 20 years old, you know. Um, I did get a free ticket to see Patrick Morales, you know. We used to turn up with a free trade on, just blag our way in. And one time, Patrick Morales had replaced Rick Waitman on the keyboards in Yes. And it's, it, he was doing a solo thing. Well, he had a telephone exchange of ARP uh, Odyssey things on the wall. <laughs> Millions of them making blips and bleeps, meaningless stuff, really, you know. I couldn't afford a guitar, so it was very difficult to relate to all that. And at the end of the show, he brought an alpine horn out the size of the stage. <laughs> 
I thought, he's had got all that electronic gear and he still has to bring an Alpine on. And that's when I thought, something's got to change, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. My, that's, that's the very that, moment, isn't it? That was the moment I thought. The Alpine horn is the final yes. nail in the coffin. Oh, that was final the final straw. Sword. That was the final straw. It was yeah. like, he's got all that stuff, you know, all the electronics. And now he brings that out and he's like, that's the final straw. In my mind, I thought, something's got to change for me. And my brief was, let's do three-minute songs, smash the gear up like the Who, and tell the audience to fuck off. <laughs> so that was my working thing. After and you saw, the, you saw the pistols at the Free Trade Hall, didn't you? The Trade Hall, yeah. lesser trade hall, yeah. sorry. The, yeah. Whatever it was, so, June the 4th, I think. Yeah, 76. Yes. So what happened was I, <clears throat> I was looking, <clears throat> I was the... I kind of formed a band with a couple of kids around the corner from me, but they had jobs and they didn't seem to mean, you know. So I, um, I, I, uh, in the local paper, it's, uh, you know, I just answered an ad and I said, I'll meet you outside the free trade hall and um, we'll write our own songs, smash the equipment and all this kind of stuff. So I went down, because I've gone to this bar, Cox's bar around the corner from me. Free trade hall, which was a great Boddington's pub at the time. So I'm stood outside the free trade hall, and there's a bloke like uh, dressed in all leather, like the Elvis Combat Tour, you know. <laughs> and it was Malcolm McLaren. And he right. said, He said, They're in here, the sex pistols. I said, I know, but uh, I'm waiting for somebody. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to form a group myself. He said, Oh, no, they're inside. And I thought, I don't remember anything about this. So I wandered in, and there was Pete Shelley collecting tickets on the door. So I said, That's where you met him. That's where I met him, yeah. Amazing. And then, so I said, I'll see you in the bar. He came up to the bar after. And I realized it was a bit like a Brian Ricks farce. We were talking at cross purposes. They were supposed to meet somebody else. And I was supposed to meet this other guy. I think they're still outside waiting now right. to this day. <laughs> Somebody should tell me. It's he not probably going to races many years later. Yeah, probably did. <laughs> so we're, we're talking now, and I thought, I don't remember saying that on the phone, but I do remember this. And so anyway, we went to we went down the stairs and watched the sex pistols come on. And there was hardly anybody there, that first one, you know, the, the first few rows. But we sat at the back, there was rows and rows of empty seats, talking about this thing called the buzz cult, you know. Um, the sex pistols came on, you know, I had no regard for the audience, looked like a glamorous New York dolls and other things. And um, it was it was the excitement, really, you know, the fast sort of three-minute songs and all that. It was just like, what's it called? Yates, the terrible beauty was born, you know. <laughs> and, um, yeah. and that's what it was, really. So the next day, me... Howard and Pete all plugged into this tiny amplifier, singing songs like Orgasm Addicts and Boredoms. It sounded terrible, you know. It sounded awful, but it was exciting. All three of us were this tiny amp. And, and that was the birth of the Buzzcock tree, you know. So you right. group directly after seeing the Pistols. And then, and then I think, supported the Pistols a few weeks later. A few weeks later, they yeah. came back. Because Howard or Pete was on a college trip to London and... A, the Pistols, uh, I think they played in some nightclubs somewhere or Chelsea Art College. They, they, they didn't even have any press at this time, really. Probably like a one column inch or something. Um, so Howard, had, I think, had said, like, if you want to come to Manchester, we'll put a show on, which he did, and that's where I met them. And a few weeks later, we, we had about seen three weeks to get our thing together to open up for them, you know. Then all the press came down for the free drinks, the free hotel, to review the Sex Pistols. And lo and behold, there's a band called the Buzzcock, the local band, which I think we was responsible for putting the provinces on the map. Putting then. Manchester on the map. That's true, because yeah. it'd been all about London, hadn't it? That's right. And then suddenly from there, you had a Liverpool scene and a Scottish scene and Sheffield scene. It was like, well, if they can do it in Manchester, you know, and all that. So I always say, if, if Jesus was born in uh, Bethlehem, I think punk really started that day in Manchester, you know, You're right. because because the Pistols got a lot of coverage, and, and we did from that gig, you know. That was the first time the, the press had gone like, "We're going to go to that gig and review it," you know, and yeah. it was it was in the sounds, enemy, and all that stuff, you know. Um, so to me, 
But you never thought at that time, I'm going to be still singing these songs in, in what, 50 years' time or whatever it is? No. Never. But still, they still do Shakespeare and he's older than me. No, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so I've still got a bit of time. But he would but be just surprised, wouldn't he? <laughs> he would. <laughs> No, I mean, it was all about the moment, really. It was just the excitement of the moment, you know. And it's, but the other thing, we, we, we thought, the, the other idea was we'll make the most uncommercial music possible. <laughs> so if you listen to Boredom, uh, uh, the Spiral Scratch EP, it sounds really rough and horrible, but beautiful at the same time. Because we had Martin Hanna, who I don't really say, it, it, it been in the studio, but he said he knows something about production. When the engineer at the studio was putting it right, he'd pull all the knobs and twist things away, and, and um, it all sounded weird, and this terrible sound we had on Spiral Scratch, but very unique and, and brilliant. So um, cause we did that because we thought, if we take this the demo tape to London, they'll laugh us out of the building, it's, you know. So we had to make our, we made our first independent single, which I think was up there with, probably Stiff may have been doing something at the same time, but mm. the Spinal Threat, it's seen as a stroke of genius, but it was a stroke of necessity as well, you know. We borrowed 500 pounds, of, took some girl's student money, and I think some of Pete Shelley died, and made this record, which inspired a lot of people to do that, you know. 500 um, quid, a lot of money, wasn't it? This time? Yeah. Well, we, you, yeah, well, this uh, posh student had about a couple of, uh, you know, I don't know how much she had for a grant, but we took half of it and borrowed it. <laughs> and, uh, I think a bit off Pete Shelley's dad and a bit here and there. 500 pounds was a lot, but we made a thousand records. And um, and that inspired a lot of groups to do that, you know. I think it was almost one of the first to do that in, in that area, you know, because yeah. we just we just thought we wouldn't get a record deal. Who were the other groups that you were looking at, the other punk groups you were looking at in terms of stagecraft, as it were, that you were nicking ideas from about the way well, you performed? Um, well, it all, I started to really, you know, I loved the class, you know, all our stable mates were good. I mean, we, we knew the Pistols from, uh, you know, the, the first gig of opening up for them. Then we went on the right, White Riot Tour with the Clash, so I loved all that as well. But also, growing what I realised, when Pete was doing a lot of the singing, and I'd sing about a third of the songs, if that live, I thought, I'm bored, I've got nothing to do. So you can see why Pete Townsend starts running about, you know. <laughs> and and there was that sense of en energy and urgency in, within the songs. And so I reacted to that. And um, some people thought I was doing bits of Pete Townsend, but really, I, would, I just thought, I'm starting to think, I see where he gets it from, you know what I mean? But also seeing Chuck Berry run up and down, you know, <laughs> in, in, in the early days, uh, and little Richard jumping on the piano. So all that was inherent in me. Because when I first got on the stage, I thought, if you read that book, The History of Mr. Polly, at the end it says everybody finds their place in life. In The History of Mr. Polly, he gets married, settles down, really doesn't like it, sex fires at a bookshop he's working in, creates his own death, you know, they think he's died. And then he ends up running a pub and fishing. And uh, I think I found my place on the stage. There's so when a parallel. I parallel. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I found my place there. But but also, it's like the whole of my life came out in there. So that's the movement to me, you know. All the angst, all the experience. You know, I kind of feel like I'm channeling that when I'm on the stage, you know. Um, it's not some act of adopted. It's like, you know, open the tap of living an experience for me so it comes out quite explosive explosive and controlled in some ways you know it's just a fire and love and energy in your belly yeah. of what what art does really you know so well, pete, so pete, I do very move sadly, around, but, pete very sadly died in 2018 yes. and so how, how was it for you adjusting to becoming the the, the lead the lead singer of the group well um there was Really live, there was kind of two of us. There, it, it, it was like a two way pull. Like, yeah, in America they used to call us Lennon and McCartney in a blender. <laughs> um, and um, but you know, I was doing a lot on the live front, you know, waving the guitar around and uh, in, inspiring the audience a lot, even and so 
you know, doing a lot of the front man job, getting them all excited while he was changing the microphone sometimes, you know. So there was always that there. So <clears throat> it was just a matter of moving from stage right to the middle, really. But I do miss him as a brother and, uh, you know, all the experiences of those early days of the idea of creating the group and, you know, the, the all the aesthetics behind it and stuff. Incidentally, when we did sign a deal, uh, Spiral Scat was, Scratch was put back three weeks to the release date because the pressing plant said, we're not printing this filth, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we, it took us three weeks to explain its art, you know. And that title... <laughs> it's art. It's all right, it's, it's art. art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, so we delayed for three weeks and they said, we refused it. You knew when they said that you was onto something good, you know. It's Absolutely. filth. We're not prints in it. Well, we're going... He's probably come from William Burris or something, you know. It's William Burris, don't care, you know. what? <laughs> and what was good about that record, many years later, people yeah. would say, I, I bought that when I was 16, and my parents would come running up the stairs going, what's he saying? Oh, that's a man, what are you listening to, you know. <laughs> so that's for cool. a lot of kids, a lot of kids, it was a delight to annoy the parents with that one. What? That was that filth, you know, for all that. <laughs> but... Um, we could understand it because everybody we thought we knew what an orgasm was, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, except, except the record company <laughs> or the pressing plant. So you're um, currently you're currently a three piece, is that right? No, we no we uh, we've got an extra uh, another guitarist in. All oh, right, okay. So he's been with us, yeah. Was a kind of a three piece. From, so I thought, uh, but it. After Pete died, um, I mean, we were due to play the Albert Hall as, with Pete as the Buzzcock, which is a gig. And um, sadly, he died before that. So we made it a memorial gig, invited a few guests and did it like that. But then we still had a few shows. So the manager said to me, because I'd done these Steve Diggle solo albums, I've got this box set. Do you want to carry on a Steve Diggle or Buzzcocks? And really, I wish I'd have done the two because I like my solo stuff and I like the mm. Buzz Um But then we had some 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 other gigs booked, so we carried on as a Buzz Cokes. But I said, if we do a tour, which we did just before COVID, I need to put a single out to make it relevant, you know. I'm not just doing, like, the Greatest Hits tour. I don't want to get caught up in that, you know. Because mm -hmm. growing up with Dylan and Bowie and the Beatles, they always had a different album, you know. It was about that to me as much as just, you know, not playing the greatest hits, you know. And um, so we had a single out, and um, then it was COVID. So I wrote this album, Sonics in the Soul. And it's the first, normally you, you get a bunch of songs and put them together in the studio, sequence them. But with this one, I wrote them to sequence, so it was like a whole journey, you know. So, like, when you read a book, you have to start at the beginning and get to the end to know what it's about, you know, rather than this cherry-picking idea people have now. Oh, I'll just, you know, download the single and all that stuff off mm. Spotify. So I tried to make Sonics in the Soul as a journey. I thought, well, you've got three openers there as part of the roller coaster, right? Now here's the bad news. We're going down, you know. But I wrote it like that. I said, now we need another one like this, and now I need one like that. And... Um, that's the first time I've done that, and it, it does seem a complete thing for the album, you know what I mean? It mm. uh, does make sense of the full journey, and that kind of wonderful thing we used to get in the early 70s, when you listen to an album as a whole meal, and your life would change, you know? It was like it was a whole, the whole album meant something, you know? Mm. Which, which seems to start getting lost, you know? You know, because people just, people so just we make al albums with a lot of singles on, you yeah. know? When you go out now, you play the new stuff and the old stuff. Yeah. Right, right. In, f in fact, um, to prove my point, because there was a few doubters, how can he carry on without Pete Shelley? Three quarters of the set was the songs I wrote, you know. And I, t I found myself doing less of his, only to prove a point like, look, I'm out here doing my own material, the songs I wrote, all the songs we wrote together, you know. <clears throat> like f Fast Cars, Promises. Why can't I touch it? They're all songs that originally came from me, you know. And he might write a verse, but I wrote the music in the court. So there was all that. And also there's some pertaining to Pete that are kind of personal and his look on life, which 
I have sang them and I've done some in reels and I thought it's not for me this, you know. Mm. I'm not I don't want to be getting into those kind of roles. But but nobody has ever bothered, you know, what we deliver is good, you know, and um and also, you know, I've been pulling out some obscure album tracks in the middle. It's it, it's been interesting to it's like um at least a three tier set, at least because you've got the kind of classic singles that you kind of got to do. Uh, the solid fans want to hear the odd album tracks. And also, you've got new songs off a new album. So it's a lot to put in within an hour, an hour and a half, you know. And that's you're right. finishing at the 100 Club, which must have a few memories, because that's where you played, didn't you, in the in the punk rock festival in 76? Absolutely, yeah. Um, um, yeah, it's kind of come full circle with that. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, they, we did that punk festival back in the day. And... Um, I think we're doing about two or three nights at the underclub at the end of the end of the year, yeah. <laughs> but um, so that'll be nostalgic to go there, and uh, it's a great honour to touch base with them because we've just been out in America playing massive shows, and the same in Germany, huge shows. You know, it, it, it's been phenomenal response out in Germany recently. What, what size venues do you play there in Germany? Well, in massive places. I don't know how to call, but huge. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was thousands there in Berlin. I can't believe it. It's all of, so you've got those kind of ones. And so it'd be nice to do the 100 Club, you know. Yeah. After, and in America, we've been doing these big festivals and stuff, you know. But uh, now on, on the big shows, when we got more time, I can bring the acoustic guitar out now. Oh, and really? Now yeah, because and, and, we had that song, Love Is Lies. But and so I kind of calmly, you know, we... Wind the audience up into a frenzy, go off and then come on, but got to bring you right down with this. Right, right. To take them back up. But what I found myself doing is now I'm, I'm sort of probably going back to the prog rock days or something. I'm I'm starting to play a lot of acoustic before I get to the, like as if I'm playing um, some um, reprise off Tommy or something. <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm like doing all this, uh, busking all this acoustic work, like did did. But it, it's not exactly that, but uh, and then I stroke it down into the lovely size. So again, something else you could never have imagined, surely in 1976. No, it wasn't, you it wasn't version. It's amazing. No, it wasn't allowed then. But um I've kind of broadened out the set a bit and, and, and our approach to it now. So it's a little bit more majestic because you kind of you know, even even singing some of them songs like Old Gasomatics, I've got to sing them as an older kind of bloke now not so like a teenager a naughty teenager or something you know um, but everything you sing and, and the persona and the phrasing which is the kind of thing you learn off Dylan really isn't it you know he, he phrases things different all his life you know and uh, um, that's an interesting point and, and also the way the songs are delivered and all that the, the way we do it now is makes the band very now if you sort of mean rather than trying to recreate the moment of 76 because you can only do things in certain times i think you know yeah so but it but it feels a great place right now at the moment but but i did laugh to myself about this acoustic thing you know <laughs> it's amazing <laughs> yeah you know. well it's fantastic to talk to you steve brilliant yeah. and you're back uh when's the next dates um we're in preston then we, we go to greece we do, we do all this and I think by September we do a massive East Coast story in the States. We come back and then we go to Australia. Australia, New Zealand. Yeah. yeah all that stuff. Uh, that's so and fantastic. It's, all it's got a, a world it, following. Brilliant. It is. People forget that. We've gone to South America as well. The new manager, because sadly the manager died uh, sort of a year ago as well. After Pete died, I had to get with the manager died as well. And uh, But he's kind of said, like, people don't realise how well-known in the world the Buzzcocks are, you know. And um, it's kind of true. We used to, you know, go around the world, but some other groups are known for it. But it's going to, I didn't imagine how, how many the Buzzcocks are. So South America, Chile, we all that. But in the meantime now, in this gap, I'm writing the new album. Right. I think it's, I think it's going to be called Attitude Adjustment. <laughs> that gives me leeway to do something different with the Buzzcocks, if you see what I mean. Yeah. This time, I've got some that the flavour of Buzzcocks, but I've got to take it somewhere else as well. You know, you don't want to rely on the same path all the time. You know? yeah. So well, I've got that's a, fantastic. I've got and a song been... called Queen of the Scene, which is about all these celebrity people 
that don't know whether they're boys, girls, transfusion, or, they, you know, they get the fame and they're very confused and, you know, traumatised. So I thought that's pretty relevant. Another one called Heavy Streets, which is about getting your phone nicked in the street or getting stabbed and falling to the floor. <laughs> so they're all relevant subjects. But very contemporary. <laughs> exactly, that's what I mean. <laughs> and me, meanwhile, there's two blokes that still waiting outside the free trade hall to meet him. <laughs> yes, if, 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 yes, that's right, David. If anybody sees them, can they if say? If anybody you know, sees them, tell them they can go home. <laughs> go home. <yes. laughs> it's all over. <laughs> it's all over. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant right. to talk to you, Steve. Nice to talk. Thanks very much. Word down your way. Testing two two.